Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. The Rise of the Chinese People's Communes by Anna Louise Strong, Part 2. Two, Autumn Upsurge. The upsurge predicted by the August Resolution came in September. The month began with 30% of China's peasants and communes, 8,634 communes with 37 million households. Hunan and Liaoning provinces led. Almost all their peasants were in communes. By September 10, Five more provinces reported their rural areas entirely thus organized. Hebei, Shanxi, Qinghai, Guangxi, and Heilongjiang, from the farthest north to the farthest southwest and west. On September 23, the Ministry of Agriculture released incredible figures. The grain crop, this includes potatoes and sweet potatoes, on a ratio of 4 pounds to 1 pound of grain, was estimated at 350 million tons, a 90% increase over 1957. No such increase had been seen in history. The figure was to be revised upward two months later, after the late rice crop brought the grain to more than double the previous year. But the September estimates were startling enough. Reasons for the gain were found especially in the increased irrigation. Since the previous National Day, October 1, 1957, new irrigation brought water for 80 million acres, more than twice the increase during the five years of the first five-year plan. China now watered 166 million acres, one-third the world's total. Soil erosion had been checked on over 320,000 square kilometers, more than had been done in the previous eight years. Over 60 million acres had been planted to trees, half again as much as in the previous eight years. The organized effort of the peasants, the ministry deduced, had accomplished far more than centralized direction by the state. These results, quote, exploded the theory, end quote, that agriculture could advance only by mechanization. For this advance was made, quote, without many tractors or much chemical fertilizer, by peasant initiative, by water conservation, farmyard fertilizer, deep plowing, soil improvement, close planting, selected seeds, pest and disease control, much cultivation, and improved tools, end quote. Quote, the triumphal results have forced industry to run forward to catch up with agriculture, end quote, claimed the ministry, noting that the new drive for a doubled steel production was partly to meet the new peasant demand for tools. Quote, a revolution in agricultural science, end quote, was given as the third result, Quote, the peasants have asked the agronomists how much grain a mow of land can be made to yield. But their own results on experimental fields are now far beyond what the scientists said were possible, end quote. Quote, this swiftly rising farm production is causing the rise of people's communes, end quote, concluded the report. Quote, China is now in an epoch when, in the words of Marx, quote, 20 years are concentrated in a day, end quote. The aim is to change the face of China in three years' hard battles. The peasants are achieving miracles, end quote. Reports from the new communes began to appear in September. Hunan, with all of its peasants now organized in 1,378 communes, reported that 262,000 public restaurants and 341,000 creches and kindergartens had been organized and these had, quote, freed 7 million women from household tasks, end quote. The increase of labor power thus available, and its better organization, had made it possible for Hunan to set up 380,000 workshops, mines, and factories under the communes, 53% of these having been established since June. 70% of Hunan's communes were providing their members and the members' families with a free supply of staple food, and competition had developed in the number of free services offered which often included clothing, housing, education, medical care, maternity care, costs of weddings and funerals, and even haircuts, theater tickets, and fuel. 
These reports were highly stimulating to the rest of China, though later it was felt that Hunan had gone too far in some details. Gansu, that arid, sparsely settled province of the northwest, was the tenth province to announce that all of its peasants were in communes. Quote, except for the pastoral areas, end quote, was the qualification made. Gansu also had, quote, a massive water conservation campaign, end quote, at the year's beginning, which had brought rice cultivation to 3 million acres, 1.2 million hectares, quote, of dry hills that had been drought-stricken for centuries, end quote. This, with other measures, had given Gansu a crop of 10 million metric tons of stable grains, two and a half times the crop of the previous year. Wushan County of Gansu announced that through, quote, better organization of labor, end quote, it had been possible to send 100,000 people to work on soil and water conservation, and they had thus completed the control of erosion on 144,000 square kilometers. Gansu proudly announced that in yield, the province had already reached, quote, the 12-year agricultural target, end quote, 10 years ahead of schedule, and that for 1959, the goal was to become an area of, quote, thousand caddy counties, end quote, counties averaging 110 bushels per acre in grain. On September 30, in an announcement made for National Day, it was stated that 90.4% of all peasant families in China had now joined people's communes. There were 23,394 communes, averaging 4,797 families each. The movement, quote, went much faster and more smoothly, end quote, than any previous drive of the cooperative advance. Everywhere it was being celebrated with drums, cymbals, firecrackers, and by joyous gatherings, featured by locally produced poems, songs, dances, and operas. Everywhere, the report showed also a sudden, many-sided advance in the rural areas. What was called, quote, the military organization of labor, end quote, stable working squads going together to the fields, was estimated to have raised efficiency 20 to 30 percent. Water conservation, road building, and manure accumulation were also going ahead at unprecedented rates. The communes had also brought rapid growth in industries, forestry, livestock, fisheries, and other sidelines. Primary and middle schools, libraries, and the organized exchange of knowledge known as, quote, red and expert universities, end quote, were also booming, as were drama groups, cinemas, and hospitals. Details of the famous Sputnik commune's achievements were published in October. Organized in April as an enlarged cooperative, though its constitution as a commune was adopted only in August, it had now a history of a full half year. The management, elected by the Congress of the Commune, consisted of 55 members. Under it came seven departments. Agriculture and Water Conservation, Industry and Communications, Forestry and Animal Husbandry, Finance and Trade, Education and Health, Labor and Welfare, Internal Affairs. There were also a planning commission and an inspection commission. The labor force was organized in 27, quote, production corps or contingents, end quote. There is no exact English equivalent. And these contained 87, quote, production brigades or teams, end quote. The larger group, or corps, pooled the draft power and implements and kept the accounts for a cluster of villages. The, quote, team, end quote, or smaller group, usually contained the labor force from a single village, from 80 to 150 workers. Public canteens, nurseries, and kindergartens were organized by the hundreds, convenient to every village and home. The, quote, happy courts, end quote, for the aged who had no relatives, and the, quote, red and expert universities, end quote, for self-education, were organized under the larger unit, the production corps. In agriculture, the Sputnik reported that the autumn grain harvest averaged 15 metric tons per hectare, 220 bushels per acre. This was partly due to, quote, more than 50 water control projects, end quote, built since April, which ensured water for 80% of all arable land. A thousand acres of low-lying land, formerly of little use, had been drained and converted to rice paddy with excellent crop. The superiority of the commune form was shown by the fact that in early spring, two of the smaller cooperatives had tried to build a joint reservoir, but had been unable to agree upon divisions of funds and labor. 
Each therefore built its own smaller reservoir, but had been unable to finish it in time to save its fields from a dry spell. When the commune was organized, it had quickly completed these two reservoirs, as well as many others. Industry had also prospered. Formerly, the only industry in the area had been a small carpentry cooperative and two blacksmiths' forges. In six months, the commune had set up 1,142 workshops and factories, in which 10,000 people worked. The largest was an iron mine, with 3,000 workers in shifts. Other shops turned out clothing, paper, edible oils, pottery, porcelain, iron tools, fire brick, cement, and fertilizer. The commune had plans for 700 more shops by the end of the year. Industrial output was expected to surpass agricultural output in value in 1959. The commune had taken over the former township administration, as well as the branch banks, shops, grain offices of the national government. These changes were reflected in the local market. Former peak seasons came twice yearly, at crop accountings, but since the commune began in September to pay monthly wages, the market showed a monthly peak. Fewer small tools were bought. The commune itself had made 14,154 small farm tools for its own use. Large purchases had, however, been made of horse carts, water wheels, double share plows, and big cooking utensils for public canteens. Cash purchases had greatly decreased, being replaced by check purchases, since most commune members, as well as the commune itself, had bank accounts. With the realization of the autumn crop, the commune had placed orders for 300 more horse carts, 12 lorries, 60 tractors, 100 gas engines, and 212 horse-drawn harvesters. Such were the six-month successes reported by Sputnik Commune. Similar successes were reported from other pioneer communes, now in existence for six months or more. Changshu Commune in Guangdong and May the First Fishing Commune have already been noted. In both of them, the 1958 income ran five times that of 1957. From Liaoning Province in Manchuria, report came from the eight communes of Kangping County, which also claimed to be, quote, among the earliest in China, end quote. Formed in April 1958 by the merging of 35 agricultural cooperatives, they averaged 5,500 households each. Their county suffers from drought and waterlogging. Part of it, on the west of the Liao River, had always been menaced by shifting sands from the north. Their yield was always low. The release of 26,000 women for farm work, through the canteens and crutches, and the better general organization of labor, made it possible, in the summer of 1958, to spare 100,000 people for watering the fields in a bad spell of drought. Threatened fields were watered from one to three times, hoed several times, and subfed with manure several times, a practice never used before. The county's grain crop came to 1,400 caddies per capita, twice that of the previous year. Water reserves for the future also made headway, six reservoirs having been built between June and September, and a hundred deep wells begun. These projects, when finished, would store all excess water, eliminate water logging, and ensure against any ordinary drought. Industry was also booming. The county, which formerly had little industry, was already dotted with 1,900 small factories, mines and workshops, including 13 coal mines, many cement plants, tile and brick kilns, some iron smelting, many fertilizer factories. Industrial output was expected to be more than six times that of 1957. One commune had sent out a team of 150 people to survey all the township resources, with intent to bring them into full use. Others would follow suit. As these earlier communes announced successes, new areas, in which even the small farm cooperatives had not been well developed, now followed the trend towards communes. From pastoral regions of Inner Mongolia, news came in November that half of the herdsmen had joined people's communes and set up creameries and workshops for tanning hides and dressing furs, as well as iron and carpentry shops. Herdsmen's cooperatives had been first formed in 1952. They had shown an annual increase in herds, at least twice that of individual herdsmen. More than a million head of their sheep were now, quote, of improved strain, end quote. 
Because of better stock, better winter protection, and better methods, 84% of the mares in use had, in 1958, produced offspring, an unheard of figure. Convinced by such facts, individual herdsmen were now flocking directly to the new communes. From the high pastoral areas of Qinghai province, next to Tibet, news came of other grazing communes. Here also, spectacular records and breeding were publicized. One shepherd in Yushan commune reported that of 429 ewes he tended, 91% had lambed, and 140 ewes had lambed twice, giving a propagation rate of 116%. Since even a rate of 100% had always been deemed impossible, this shepherd had become famous, and his methods were studied by all the others. Stable settlements were appearing among the Qinghai nomads, based on creameries, soap factories, tanneries, wool textile mills, and supplied through the commune with public dining rooms, nurseries, kindergartens, and schools. In Holka area, where only 12 children attended the primary school in 1957, now all the 275 children of school age went to school. The same area had only 25 adults learning to read and write in 1957, but now there were 600 adults enrolled in 28 classes for illiterates. The nomads were settling down. A, quote, timber commune, end quote, appeared in the far north in Jilin province. Six farming townships with 40,000 peasants in a vast forest area with 12,000 lumberjacks combined. The area had valuable minerals, fur-bearing animals and medicinal herbs. The Ministry of Forestry had wished to develop its resources, but it lacked labor power, and it even had to import all commodities needed for the lumber workers. By merging with the township farms, all labor would be used for farming in the busy season and would fell timber in winter. The entire area would quickly be self-sufficient in food and many commodities. It planned for self-sufficiency in iron and steel in 1959, and in all locally needed machinery by 1960. Even more significant was the combination formed of timber workers and peasants in Fujian province, the coastal province still under fire from Chiang Kai-shek's troops in Qinmen. The province is mountainous, with much valuable timber. It had, in the past, few roads. As a result of the new form of joint organization, an army of 100,000 peasants and lumberjacks got out in a few months 3 million cubic meters of timber doubling the previous year's output. Replanting of trees was adopted at the same time as felling. Some 70,000 hectares, 175,000 acres, were thus reforested, and 270,000 hectares, 675,000 acres, closed as forest reserve, both these figures being greater than the totals for the past eight years combined. The peasants and timber workers were now planning the entire area, part for crops, and part for forests, according to soil. From many parts of China came news of reclamation plans based on this new strength. The plans of Anhui peasants to crisscross their entire area with canals, bringing irrigation, drainage, and water transport to every county, which were noted in the previous winter, now began to be discussed for other parts of the North China Plain. Other spectacular reclamation work appeared, of which I here note that of two provinces, Gansu, in Shanxi. Gansu, which was already bringing the Tao River waters over the mountains to irrigate two and a half million acres, introduced another project, the reclamation of, quote, Big Barren Mountain, end quote, an arid region of 1,575 square kilometers in central Gansu, ruined by centuries of overgrazing and tree cutting. The farm cooperatives had halted the loss of soil and water in 1953, but had not been strong enough to undertake positive reclamation. The area was potentially rich with good soil, but lacking in water. In autumn of 1958, the Provincial Party Committee drew up a plan, and four adjacent counties combined to handle the work. They sent 37,000 workers to the area, terraced 56,800 acres of sloping lands, built ponds and check dams on 7,400 acres, planted trees on 3,700, and deep-plowed 4,000 acres of arable land. They announced that they had, quote, preliminary control of soil and water, guaranteed against 100 days of drought, end quote. Achievements in Shanxi were to set a new precedent. 
This mountain province, southwest of Beijing, on the middle reaches of the Yellow River, was one of China's worst erosion areas. Its soft, low-est soil ran down ravines in an annual loss of 300 million tons. Its lowest highlands rise 9,000 feet above sea level. Winters are long and cold. Half of its former 11 million, quote, arable acres, unquote, were classed as, quote, sloping, end quote. In the past, these areas being sparsely settled, the peasants tried to make up for low yield by extensive cultivation, for which they lacked adequate labor power, tools, and manure. Long years of such practice had reduced grain yield to a provincial average of 11 bushels per acre, and lower than that in bad areas or bad years. Harvests increased after liberation, but this went slowly. The extended areas and poor tools left little surplus strength for soil improvement. From these efforts, however, the Provincial Party Committee finally unearthed an important fact. Some farming cooperatives in the Luliang Mountains a bad area east of the Yellow River that had averaged only 8 bushels per acre were increasing yield year by year. They had stopped tilling the worst lands and concentrated labor on the better lands. They got not only higher yield on those lands, but a higher total crop. Results were published. All over, the province the peasants discussed it and made plans to visit Luliang cooperatives. In 1958, the province adopted what they called the, quote, basic farmland plan, end quote, the cutting of acreage to increase the total crop. In 1958, Shanxi planted to grain only 6,125,000 acres, just 65% of the previous year. They deep plowed this land to a depth of 13 to 40 inches. They manured it deeply, with an average of 50 tons per acre. They leveled it as much as possible and built irrigation works to water it. They, quote, garden farmed it, end quote. The land taken out of cultivation was planted to trees or fodder grass. Results in crops were striking. The wheat yield for spring and winter wheat combined averaged 50 bushels per acre, four times the 1957 figure. The total crop was 10 million tons, which was 130% higher than the best previous crop, that of 1956, on a much larger acreage. Records of individual counties were even more remarkable. Shilo County and those Luliang Mountains, where previous crops had been 8 bushels per acre and where long erosion had made 1,500 ravines, cut its sowing area drastically, tilling only 20,000 acres of the best, most level land, just 30% of the previous area, and got by intensive cultivation 110 bushels per acre, with a total crop six times any they had ever seen before. In late August, the province formed people's communes everywhere because, quote, they wanted a wider, more flexible organization for bigger jobs, end quote. During the year, they recorded the terracing of nearly 4 million acres and the planting to trees of 23 million acres, most of this being done in the last four months of the year. Shanxi province announced that within one year, erosion had been cut by one-third saving to the province 100 million tons of good lowest soil annually. As winter approached, Shanxi announced that the acreage would again be reduced, and even more intensively cultivated. Shanxi would be, quote, garden farmed, end quote. Visitors to the Taihang Mountains in Shanxi already noted a new type of landscape. Instead of the barren hills, there are wide level valleys, crisscrossed by irrigation ditches, deep plowed and neat as gardens from which rise grassy slopes to groves of saplings on the hills. Fish are for the first time bred in the province, and reservoirs built for irrigation. 7,000 new irrigation projects were planned for the winter of 1958-59, and all of these also would be used to add to the local fish supply. Other subsidiary jobs appeared for winter. Shanxi Hills have excellent coal. The communes opened mines and began to make coke and tar products, as well as iron and steel. The, quote, basic farmland system, end quote, of cutting acreage to increase total crop was tried in 1958 in several provinces, but nowhere so widely as in Shanxi. Its success led to its adoption as a nationwide plan in the Communist Party's December resolution. 
the livelihood of the people changed swiftly as a result of these changes in crop. In late November, the harvest of late rice in southern provinces, much of which was cultivated and reaped after the communes were formed, came in at well above twice that of the previous year, and raised the crop estimates of the entire country to 375 million tons of bread grains, more than double that of 1957. Guangzhou announced that the per capita grain production of Guangdong province was 1,870 pounds, almost a ton. On this basis, all commune members and their families would get three daily meals without payment, with steamed rice at every meal, as well as other dishes, no limit being placed on the amount. Meetings and celebrations were held to greet this announcement, with songs, dances, and quote, operas, end quote, and speeches, contrasting the quote, old society, end quote, with the new. Yang, leader of a production team in Qianjin County, told how in the old society, his father had died of hunger, and his mother had sold his sisters for food. Now, hunger was conquered in Guangdong, that province from which so many hundreds of thousands of Chinese in the past migrated overseas to live. This result had been expected, for Guangdong is a strong province. But when Guizhou province, that hilly southern area known as one of China's poorest, also announced a grain crop of 1,470 caddies per capita, with free meals served by its 1,806 people's communes to all the 3 million-odd households in the province, then people all over China cheered. Let us see how the communes came even to the primitive people, like the Li Su's, a minor nationality in western Yunnan. For ages unknown, they have lived in trackless mountains on the upper rapids of the Salween, locally called the Nu. Their primitive life had not even reached the stage of slavery, much less feudalism or capitalism. They grew maize by the slash and burn method, without metal tools. They neither fertilized nor cultivated, and the yield was very small. So winter brought empty bins, and the people fed on grass roots and tree bark. Sometimes, a child was sold for grain. Sometimes, corpses were found in spring in the melting snow, of men who tried to carry packs over the passes for small pay and couldn't make it. The life of primitive man was neither comfortable nor secure. Thus, they had lived for ages. Liberation brought roads, national equality, some welfare funds, and some tools. Grain crops had doubled by 1955, but were still not enough. By this time, the Lisus had an autonomous district and a few Lisu organizers. These took the situation in hand. In winter of 1957-58, to the Lisus dug hundreds of irrigation ditches and opened 13,200 acres of rice paddy, piling on manure. When a bumper crop gave them three quarters of a ton per capita, the Lisus were in happy trouble. No Lisu had ever built a barn. They filled tubs and baskets. The people crowded together and filled the vacated houses with grain. Finally, they had to build new buildings for grain and discovered the problem of plenty. Next came the problem of how to eat the stuff. Lisus had never cooked rice. They were used to ground maize, parched in a cauldron on a bonfire. So Chinese cooks came into the area to teach the cooking of rice and the making of bean curd. But next came trouble with the maize. It had always been ground in wooden mortars, but what with the bumper crop in the public kitchens, the mortars wore out. So carpenters and masons came to the hills and taught the Li Su's how to make water wheels for grinding corn, in a technique practiced in China for thousands of years, which Li Su's had never known. Li Su's now have communes with all the fixings, including public canteens and free food. The canteens serve both rice and cornbread, with one soup and one vegetable dish at every meal, and meat once a fortnight. In most of China, this is now considered a low standard. But the Li Su's think that they have jumped right over slavery and feudalism and capitalism into socialism, skipping everything in between. Their current song runs, quote, Everyone eats full without pay. Our ancestors never heard of it. Is it a dream? No, it's a fact. Where? Right here. The East is red. Hail to Mao Zedong, end quote. Such was the great variety of people swept into the people's communes, 
and the upsurge of late 1958. Quote, In Beijing, a flower bloomed, and to the Vale of Daliangshan came fragrance. In Beijing, a red flag rose, and the glow carried all over Daliangshan. End quote. New folk song of Yi people. <laughs> 